<laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, so this hangout is part of a uh, an ACS sponsored project. Um, last fall, I started meeting with Claudia and um, Sean. Sean in our uh, in our learning uh, area, and we started talking about MOOCs. Uh, this was kind of something that. Obviously, the previous spring had just come up. Uh, it was growing quickly, the birth of Coursera and Udacity and edX. And the question was, what impact was this going to have on a small university like Trinity? What should we be concerned about? In what ways might this be useful for us as a university? And we wanted to start a dialogue on this, but we needed it to be an informed dialogue. Uh, so us just sitting around and sharing opinions was was not what we were, really wanted to go for. Uh, the support from the ACS was something that we looked for so that we could have people take some MOOCs and then we could start off an informed dialogue. So this is our first hangout in beginning this informed dialogue. Uh, each of the people here has taken a course in a MOOC and we want to talk about our experiences and then uh, Wayne Anderson will be asking us questions about our experience and hopefully we can learn a little bit more about how these things are significant uh, to, to small campuses. So I'll start off the introductions myself. I'm Mark Lewis. I'm in the Department of Computer Science at Trinity University. And the MOOC that I took was Principles of Functional Programming Using Scala uh, through Coursera. And I guess I should, uh, is Claudia, are you part of? Are, um. so? I'll introduce myself. I'm Claudia Schultz. I'm the coordinator for the project. Um, I haven't finished any MOOCs, but um, I'm going to be watching the chat room so that I can um, let you know if there are any questions from the audience that's watching online. Okay, so I'm just here in the background, stage managing. Okay. Okay. I'll run across the the images, the thumbnails that I have. Uh, Christiane. Uh, Christiane is was helping Wayne, so she's not okay. participating. Okay. Not participating. Uh, Dennis. So, hi, I'm Dennis Ugolini from uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy at Trinity University. I took a Coursera course called Galaxies and Cosmology uh, from the California Institute of Technology, which was particularly fun because I took the same course uh, when I was an undergrad there about 19 years before. So. Interesting. Forrest. So I'm Forrest Stonedahl from Center College, uh, professor of computer science and mathematics here. Um, I, I took two courses from Coursera last fall, one on computer science and one in business, and I'm currently enrolled in the Artificial Intelligence for Robotics course at Udacity, which is one of the seminal courses that kind of got the ball rolling for uh, Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig and, um, and in launching the MOOC scene. So. Gabe. So I'm Gabe Ferrer. I teach uh, computer science at Hendricks College. I'm enrolled in two of Udacity's courses. Uh, the Programming a Robotic Car course with Sebastian Troon that Forrest is also taking. <coughs> I've also been taking the uh, web programming course that Udacity offers, um, which is being offered by I just forgot his name. I guess retention isn't a great strength of MOOCs necessarily, but uh, <laughs> he uh, was one of the co-founders of Reddit, actually, and so he has actually a lot of great insight about how to uh, build a robust web application. Mary? I'm Mary Fairbairn. I'm on the library faculty at Furman University, and I took a course called The Social Context of Mental Illness and Wellness, um, and uh, uh, through Coursera. Okay. I also have Rebecca and Rob. Rebecca, are you? I'm here. I okay. signed up for two MOOCs that I have not completed, but I signed up for one on the Ancient Hero by um, Greg Naj. It's a course he's been teaching for a long time, um, both face to face and online. Um, yeah, so, and classics, so it's in my field. And the other one I signed up for was Passion Driven Statistics from Wesleyan, which was, again, one of the early MOOCs being offered by Liberal Arts College, and I wanted to see how that was going to be different from the other type of MOOCs. Cool. Rob? Uh, I took uh, 
four different ones. I didn't complete them throughout the course and the time frame, but I did go through them, and they were mostly around uh, creativity, education, and programming. Okay. And our, I guess, our moderator, Wayne? I'm here to learn and listen. <laughs> Excited about everything you've done. And thank you enough for going through the effort. So I guess now you get to ask us questions. <laughs> oh gosh! Well, I only have about I only have about thirty. <laughs> okay. No, but let me say at the outset, I really am grateful for what you've done. I think it's fantastic. As you know, in the consortium, we're trying to learn learn more. And Rebecca, may I say to you, Knightley's been very helpful in this process, and Rebecca in particular has been very helpful. We're trying to learn what's out there and experiment, test, and so on. And I also wanted to make a little plug that we've got three grants now for follow-up possibilities from the Mellon Foundation and the Teagle Foundation and the Woodruff Foundation. So we're in a position maybe to do some more testing. That that was a paid political announcement. Okay, <laughs> get that, that out there. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just so anxious to learn what your reactions uh, were. How, how about I start with real general things like what are the lessons? Uh, what, what general lessons did, did you learn from these experiences? What are the pluses and minuses? Now the question is who wants to answer first? <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. I'll go first. Um, so like I mentioned, I've signed up for two of these things from Udacity. Um, for me personally, among the pluses is just the professional development opportunity. You know, so you know, I've been out of grad school for 12 years. I did a lot of robotics then. The field changed a lot, largely because of Sebastian Thrun. So his course was a really nice opportunity to get myself caught back up. Um, one thing that was really interesting about it is um, I have his book. Um, on, on the subject, and the MOOC is a lot more accessible than the book, in, in my experience. And I think there are several reasons for that. When academics write books, they write them to be comprehensive and, frankly, impressive, right? So, you know, they, they, it's showing off might not be the exact word, but that's definitely the concept, right? You want to... Uh, demonstrate the comprehensiveness of your erudition and knowledge of the topic, whereas, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the MOOC format is all about being intelligible to your audience. I, so I think that there's a psychological difference between the process of producing a MOOC and a book that gives it some utility. That said, you know, ultimately one of the problems with the MOOC is that it lacks the kind of depth that you get from an actual book. Um, so there's some issues there, you know, like, you know, sometimes you would go on these weird tangents that seemed kind of pointless or not really getting at the heart of the matter. He would go over algorithms that I thought were secondary to the real meat of um, what the concern was. So it was kind of a mixed bag in that way. You might say it was a great video abstract of the book. Now, my experience with the web programming class is a little different. There, what you have is a not not a traditional academic. I mean, the kid the kids only got a bachelor's degree, which of course in academia makes you subhuman, and uh, so normally you wouldn't, um, you know, be dared to be caught in, in a class with such a person. But he knows a lot more than practically any professor would on the subject because he's actually built real businesses and real websites and dealt with issues that um, pencil-headed academics just don't have to struggle with, and so. I found it really valuable from that standpoint. I actually took some of his lessons and then turned them into units in my own courses. So I found it very valuable from that standpoint. Um, I have lots of other things to say, but I want to give somebody else a crack at it. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah. Please, others. Okay, well, I guess I'll jump in. Um, one thing I have to say is I expect that the people's experiences and, uh, and lessons vary greatly depending upon the topic. Uh, you notice there are three computer science faculty here, and I think that <laughs> computer science is, is an area, obviously it, it's kind of where the MOOC started, um, and it's also one that, that I think is very well done 
uh, computer science works well for, for MOOCs. The MOOC that I took had, as far as I know, the highest completion rate of any of the large MOOCs. There was a 20% completion rate for my class, uh, which is double what, what they normally get. Um, and, and part of that, though, is just because the, the... I think there was a very different population that signed up for it. It was lots of professionals. And on the whole, I found it to be a remarkably positive experience. It was obviously it was good for for my continued professional development, but I thought that it would have been a very useful way for for many students to learn. The only drawback it might have had was it moved quickly, and it was at a level where I think a lot of my undergraduates would have had a hard time keeping up with it. It would need some tweaking to really be useful for for a a, a course um, that you know. If, if it were just a normal student learning from it. I can I can follow up on that since I also took the <coughs> course Mark did on the Scala programming language uh, in the fall. And actually I worked to, um, together with a student. We met weekly uh, to work through the... Well, actually I started with a group of four or five students but all but one of them had dropped out. Forrest, I'm having trouble hearing. I don't know if others... I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Am I, is my volume <laughs> Um, is my volume okay now? It, it's a little low. I can hear you, but it's, it's not as loud as the others. Still. Okay, so I was just going to say um, that I worked with a student last fall um, working through the Scala programming MOOC. Um, I started with several students, but most of the, all except one of them dropped out and, and quit working on it. But um, I did find, just like Mark said, that in fact it was pitched a bit high and if I hadn't had weekly meetings where I really helped the student learn the material, uh, they wouldn't have completed the, the course, essentially. I'm interested in hearing from Dennis, because he is the only person who has a true comparison of, of the yes. same being offered in person and in a MOOC. Okay, well, I guess the, the thing that surprised me the most was, uh, you know, I grew up watching the, the mechanical universe on public broadcasting, and, and so I had this picture of if you were going to have content online, that it would have to have production values, uh, title screens, theme music, uh, <laughs> animation, math flying by. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it turns out it really doesn't need that any more than it necessarily needs it in a classroom. Uh, now, on the flip side, the thing I was really surprised about was how bad my retention was. And I was really trying. I mean, I'm in the Dep Department of Physics and Astronomy, but I am not in any way an astronomer. It's kind of a running joke that I work on an astronomy experiment, even though I have no astronomy ex experience whatsoever. Uh, and, and so I was really trying to learn this stuff and struggling just because of... Uh, was it because I wasn't doing homework? Was was it because I found it easier to get through the lectures in one shot whenever it was convenient to do that? But that's a bad way if you want to actually remember things. I'm not sure. So you did better when you took it as an undergraduate? The funny thing is I had forgotten until I got about three weeks in, but that's roughly where I dropped it as an undergraduate <laughs> when I decided <laughs> I didn't want to be an astronomer anymore. Uh, so after about the third week, it was <coughs> new. So I have a question, Dennis. The format of the class, did the videos have the, the inserted questions for, for reinforcement to make you pay attention? They, they did. Uh, although I should say that after, so first of all, the thing that struck me was they were being made as the course went along. Because at one point, the instructor got the flu, and then there was a two-week delay where no new lectures were posted. So that shocked me. I, I thought you would have put those all in the can and just posted them over time. Uh, but the other thing I noticed was just as student th enthusiasm wanes over time, apparently instructor enthusiasm wanes as well because the first couple weeks there would be breaks periodically within each lecture with one of those questions you must answer to advance. Starting from about roughly when he got sick, there would be one right at the end of each one, uh, and and that was a bit less effective. Mary? Mary? Um, well, I came to the course from a few different perspectives, um, and on the really positive end um, was I'm hearing impaired, and so having closed captions available for all of the lectures 
was fantastic for me. You know, TED's about the only other place I can get that. Um, and also, uh, you know, the asynchronous aspect of it was great as a single mom because I could, you know, watch 15 minutes of a lecture, you know, waiting at the daughter's office or after my daughter went to bed and so on. But um, primarily, my experience isn't so positive. Um, the instructor was fantastic, but I had no access to her other than in the videos. Um, and that was such a huge part of my undergraduate education and working with the professors. You know, after my first year, I pretty much um, chose my courses by what I knew of the professors rather than by the content of the course because it made such a big difference to me. And I really missed, um, you know, not having the professor in the discussion forum to guide the discussion. Um, it just, you know, became completely confessional and, and we weren't really getting anywhere with the discussions. So it'd be very difficult to introduce that into one of your courses or draw on this for part of a course, would it? Yeah. Oh, Rebecca or Robert? I'm going to opt out of reporting on my okay. experience because, as I said, I, I, I ended up opting out of my MOOCs because I had two trips right around the same time. Um, I'm kind of more interested in hearing what everybody else heard. So you're <laughs> saying you have the typical MOOC student experience. Yeah, yeah. I really did. I mean, I, I will Without say even that from my experience, it. Yeah. It, it, evidently I did not have enough motivation. <laughs> you're, you're one in a million. Rob. Nah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that my experience was one where I was so excited that I had access to so many different classes that I oversubscribed myself. Yeah. And so I was getting hit by just all of these messages. <clears throat> so I ended up finding a couple of different ones that I was more interested in than the others and, and spending more time going through their content. Um, I, like a lot of other people, was doing a lot of traveling and other things at that time, so completing the course was not really as much of an objective as experiencing it. Um, being in the Center for Learning and Technology, I'm much more interested in the production experience in case I have to, if I ever have to support these. And so it's been really interesting <laughs> seeing, you know, what, what's the gear involved, what's the software. And, and one of the things I have to say is that I'm really impressed with sort of the variety of experiences that I saw. Um, you know, in, in some ways it's easy to boil it down to how does this compare to my learning management system in a lot of ways, but um, it's clear that these are, in some cases, very high production value, and that's really interesting to me. Um, as far as from an educational standpoint, I do this with a lot of video-based kind of content in this nature, which is I, I really go to it as a point of need. So if I'm writing code or if I'm thinking about something for a project, I'm more interested as a reference point. So I use it the same way I might use a site like Stack Overflow or some other type of uh, search and discussion space. And, and, and really, I, you know, that's not the way they want you probably intentionally to go through it as, as, as a course, but that's the way that I find myself using a lot of those resources. So more of a kind of open educational resource experience was what um, gave me the greatest value from that experience. Would you all take, take these or take other MOOCs uh, in the future? I mean, is there enough there, say, if, in terms of professional development? To oh, oh, yes. Uh, so I identify with Rebecca in the sense that I really wanted to take some more MOOCs this semester. Um, and then my schedule just told me that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but I fully intend this summer to take at least two more. Uh, just you know, and then we'll see how things go beyond that. Yeah, I, I want to say again, especially computer science. There are so many resources out there in the MOOC world. Um, it's really great for professional development. Um, and computer science, the, the content we were trying to teach and learn is changing so quickly um, that it's you know it's nice to have a structured way to do that. And the alternative essentially is to buy a book or to get a textbook. Um, or to maybe you know go go somewhere to a workshop or something like that, but MOOCs have a lot of advantages both in convenience and the way that the material is is sort of a scaffolded, um, starting very simple and working up. So it's it's well organized. Um, I think there's really a lot of potential for professional development uh, there. Going back to to Rebecca and what, what she was talking about, I have to say so. While I did finish the MOOCs I did in the fall. I'm only still on week one out of seven on the Udacity course, and I started 
it about, um, I don't know, probably eight or nine weeks ago now. <laughs> and uh, so one of the things, when you ask, one of the things I've learned, these MOOCs are, they're very different. Um, having the, done these three different MOOCs, they're all different experiences. And one of the things that, that makes them different, in particular, a big factor for me is that some of them um, require that you do things on schedule. And you have to meet the deadlines, do the homework, um, and progress to the next stage. And this is, this is true, I think, at least most of the Coursera courses. But on Udacity, at least some of them, including this repeat of the AI course, it's just on your own. And it's just as flexible as you want it to be. And I thought that would be great to be flexible. But it's really, um, it's really hard to get motivated, essentially. If you know you don't have to do it, you, I keep putting off, oh, next week, oh, next weekend. I'll have time next weekend. And I've done that, um, you know, for about the last seven weekends. And, and I do think it doesn't feel much like a course to me, whereas the other ones did have more of a feeling of a course. This one feels more like it's just kind of some resources out there, like a YouTube videos, um, stuff that I could be doing. And it also doesn't feel alive because there aren't, I mean, students doing it are all just wherever they happen to be. They're not working through it together. There's no community whatsoever right now, um, at least that I'm aware of around that course which wasn't true the first time it was, it was launched. And there were you know, hundreds of thousands of people working through that one course all together with some kind of sense of community, even if that was just uh, shouting at each other in a really large discussion board that no one was listening to. Um, but I, anyway, so I think, I think you can't just judge uh, MOOCs by a single one. They vary widely by what the professor offers, uh, what the course is designed around, what its goals are. Um, and some of them are definitely a lot better than others. Can I ask a question? Um, based on what Forrest just said, you know, there is the tradition of the of the connectivist MOOCs, where a lot of this got started even before the ARI course uh, a year ago. And the point of those MOOCs, um, which were run by by George Siemens and Stephen Downs and Dave Cormier and was to develop personal learning networks. And I'm wondering if in, in any of your MOOCs, did you meet people? Did you form connections? Did, was there any communication with your peers that extended beyond the course? Or was it all like this professor who you didn't really have access to was sort of the, the hub and everyone else was kind of just floating around aimlessly? So, for me, so, it was definitely the latter. And granted, I was doing Udacity for both of my courses. Um, that said, I didn't really um, want a whole lot of community. No. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to go in, figure stuff out, and, and, and move on. Um, so, I mean, that's just my own particular baggage I was bringing to it. Um, Definitely, when I was a college student and a graduate student, the community was incredibly valuable, and I felt I learned as much from my peers as I did from the professor. Um, but they were also my friends, you know, and, and it just gave it a different dynamic to be, you know, with these people in class day after day, dorms and everything else. I mean, the class itself was never the foundation of the community. It was actually being in college and being physically there. Um, yeah, with a MOOC, it just seems really artificial. I mean, I participated in discussion forums a couple of times, largely when I got confused and I had questions about things. Um, and I used it just like Stack Overflow, really. You know, okay, so I look around, see if I can find an answer to my question. Answer found, moved on, you know. I've got lots of community in my life. I don't need more. You know, it's just, um, yeah, it just wasn't um, part of what I was trying to get out of it. How about my, the others? Yeah, my guess is that, that just because of the nature of the population we have here, we're all, we have busy schedules, and we're trying to get through these MOOCs, you know, with, in some ways, almost a minimal time commitment in some ways, at which hampers the community. I know that in the case of the MOOC I took, they actually, people set up, they used meetup.com, and they set up meetings. And so in the cities where there were larger populations of people, in the case of San Antonio, I don't know if there was more than, you know, 
three or four of us taking this class, but in some of the large metro areas where you had lots of programmers, there were meetups and people did establish some community around it. Hmm. Can I ask a, a follow-up question? You know, you, you brought up, you know, our experience of the sort of, essentially what we have here is a bunch of professional learners. Uh -huh. we're, we've, all, we've all reached that lifelong learning thing. Um, and I know that some of the stats for coursework say that like at least 80% of the people who take coursework courses have a BA. So I'm curious, Forrest, if you could say more about your students' experience taking mm -hmm. the MOOC. I mean, did they make contacts with anyone or was it just because they were meeting with you weekly, they had that contact with you? Well, yes. I mean, the reason they found out about it was because I advertised it. I was like, you know, hey, students, this is a, a neat thing that's happening. Um, again, I was, you know, it's in this is a, this is a case of learning a new newish programming language, so it's sort of an up and coming language, um, and you know it's easy. It's fairly easy to get students excited. That's why there were about four or five of them that were interested to begin with. Until the course work ended up being quite a bit of of work and taking a lot of time. And of course, they have their real courses at center that they're trying to do, um, and whatnot. So, I think um, yeah, we didn't. None of us sort of connected with the outside community. Um, we had our weekly meetings that, that eventually became the weekly meetings of just two of us. Um, but, um, and we discussed the material together, and that actually made the course a lot more fun, uh, I think, just having someone to discuss it with in person, um, as opposed to some of the, the other ones where you really are just isolated. But no, although I will say, um, that then this the student did go and and you know he was able to talk about this when he did job interviews this year um, and his employers were like oh that's cool that you took that initiative um, to go and do something extra on top um, of what you'd done and, and learn something that was at least that was my impression um, that it might have been beneficial um, to sort of show that that at this stage he was sort of an overachiever or something or. We, we have one question for, coming in from people who are watching on air. Um, Michael Hughes here at Trinity is asking, how disruptive for higher ed do you think MOOCs really are? Does it break down disciplinary lines um, or is this overheating from hype? Um, I, Aaron Delwich and I were having a conversation not long ago about uh, the hype cycle and MOOCs and whether this was all just a craze um, or if there's something really disruptive here. Uh, and and uh, I think that's a good question for you all who have the first-hand experience to try and answer. Anyone else want to start? Uh, Mark, I, I'll I'll start. Oh. I was going to say I can share two data points for you. I don't know if this is true or not, but this is, again, we're watching this at nightly as well, and we've done several seminars on MOOCs. And I will say the one that I thought was interesting is the story that came out from Amherst mm -hmm. last week, I think it was, now. where they said Amherst looked at doing, um, I think they were course robot, may not, they were looking no, at doing it was edX. It was edX, that's right, you're right, it was edX. They looked at edX and decided not to. And then the other thing um, I heard is from um, Simon Gray at the GLCA who said that they were, you know, last fall hearing from deans at their member institutions saying we're really worried about MOOCs, we really have to do something about it, and that that sense of urgency has gone. So it seems like the hype, at least, is going down and maybe, I don't know, I think we still see MOOC stories every day, but th there's my, my two data points. My own opinion, for what it's worth, is that um, MOOCs are good at some things and bad at others. And from a computer science point of view, there's a lot of material in the discipline that can be learned through drills, you might say, kind of like one learns arithmetic through drills and so forth, and I think MOOCs can be pretty effective for that. Where I doubt their effectiveness is with some higher level issues like what does a good design look like for a piece of software? <clears throat> What's good design? What's bad design? When I teach um, upper level classes and things like software engineering, I have to spend a lot of intensive time with students and their code going over what about it is good design? What about it is bad design? The little quiz thingies in the MOOCs just aren't going to do that. And uh, that kind of capacity to develop good taste in design, good design, bad design, 
is, in my opinion, a lot of what distinguishes an effective uh, developer from an ineffective developer. And I don't actually see how one could hope to teach that in a MOOC kind of a setting. So I could imagine getting to a point where for certain basic skills, there's some hybridization of using MOOCs for some basic skills, but I think there's these higher level issues um, that the MOOC format just isn't appropriate for. Um, and I, I was amused actually taking the AI MOOC that often the code that they presented was um, textbook examples of how not to design software. I mean, it was, uh, some of the design was terrible, and I was shuddering at the thought that any student would use some of that as a model for how they would think about design. Granted, that's not an intrinsic flaw of MOOCs, but that they can actually help students shape and develop in that way, I just don't see at all. Can you, can you broaden that to say it'd be harder to apply some of these in the humanities, for example, as against STEM areas? Or is that I mean, too that, broad? That's certainly my impression. Um, that said, uh, you know, if you're teaching a live course and the course is bad, a MOOC may well be superior. You know, if you're going into even a humanities class with a lecture-only pedagogy and the like, so lecture-only combined with some multiple-choice tests and no real formative assessment of the writing, then that might not be better than a MOOC. And so in that sense, um, you know, higher education as a whole probably needs to be careful, but I think liberal arts colleges have some real advantages there in that our culture of pedagogy is to step back from just lecturing and really get into more formative approaches to education that are more interactive. Um, I would feel a little more threatened if I were at a school where the pedagogy was more directly in competition with um, what something like a MOOC has to offer. I, I was going to point out two things. If, Mark, do you want to go ahead or you want me to? No, go, go ahead. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I, one thing that's interesting that's happening here in San Antonio, just as a data point as well, is that um, San Antonio, next to Austin specifically, is really struggling to develop what they would probably refer to as a technical class. And again, this is easier to kind of probably talk about um, re in regards to this, but a lot of government monies as well as independent monies have been dumped into trying to solve this problem. And Rackspace specifically has said, we're going to take the mantle of dealing with this issue in San Antonio. And so they've basically started a whole program that they've been piloting both through the education system proper as well as internally to solve the problem through MOOC style interactions of developing a technical class here at the sort of city level. And they're, they're really doing some interesting stuff there. And the thing that they're promising as a part of this that I think is really compelling is they're promising tens of thousands of jobs waiting at the other end of the completion of this process. And that right there, I think, poses one of the things that we see a lot of questions about, not just in liberal arts, but just really across the whole scope of the educational experience. As when we come out the other end, here you have industry saying, we'll design our own education experience in these styles and deliver upon something that is really sort of the real takeaway that people will get concerned about at the end of their educational experience, especially if they've spent a lot of money on it. Um, I don't think that's what it's all about, certainly not at the liberal arts institution, but I think that is something that I think we can't ignore, and I think you see more and more cities doing this style of thing. Um, and, and to see it so well-developed in concert with the government here locally, I think is what is so interesting about this. You don't see, I think, this level of participation by governments until they start becoming, I think, very aware of some of the deficiencies they, ha they have and how to ramp up very quickly. Interesting. For me, the, the idea that there's a threat is comes from, it's the economics. Um, it's not, I don't think that MOOCs can teach as well as, as, you know, as we can. On the other hand, I think that MOOCs can teach for so much less cost than we can that every, every prospective student is doing a balancing act. And, and really, if they, if they pose a threat, it's because the balancing act is, if the MOOCs become 
accepted enough by employers. Okay, if the the whole idea yeah. that on, on the other end, if they think that a MOOC can actually get them a positive income, and the MOOC costs a hundred thousand dollars less than the traditional college, that starts to become a real co competitor, even if the quality isn't really all that comparable. I mean, I would worry about the level of software development competence that would result in, from something like that. Um, I I tend to think that well, well, you know, we have a free public school system, right? And still, lots of people send their kids to private schools. You know, there there are lots of people who, including me, actually, my my kids are in private schools. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're right, right. You know, I'm in Arkansas. You can joke about it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the 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 point being that um, there are enough parents with enough money. I'm hypothesizing that want to be able to set their kids apart. That I think there will still be something of a market for the kinds of things that we do. That said. I think your point's a pretty deep one. You know, it, there, there's you know this whole issue of marginal utility, really, and there might be a degree to which employers say, well, you know, if we can get them some basic chops, we can teach them design ourselves through more of an apprenticeship system. Um, there might be something to that, and then it just becomes a matter of, well, if that sweet spot in developing employees exists out there, how long does it take to get discovered um, by the economy? And I mean, that's just hard to predict, right? Um, because the flip side of it is that employers try to, I mean, they know how they have to train their employees to some degree, but they, they do want to minimize that. And so it's, it's an interesting trade-off. It'll be interesting to see how it develops. You know, in the meantime, I think what institutions like ours have to do is to continue articulating the value added of the residential education and there's not a whole lot we can do about the price, <laughs> um, but we can at least continue to articulate the value added and see if that continues to find a market. You know, that, that's as much of an internal piece as I've found about this issue. But yeah, I mean, it could be, right, in, in principle, you know, if these were sufficiently great and um, online Google Hangout tutoring services turn out to be just as good as office hours or, or what have you, then yeah, residential colleges could be extinct. But I think we're too far from that part of the search space to um, predict that something like that might come out that way. Dennis, Dennis any thoughts uh, from you on this uh, disruptive possibility? Uh, I mean, I, I like the idea, uh, what some of the people were saying about how employers would develop this and such. The only problem I have with it is left to their own devices too many people would simply not be successful because there's a certain additional motivation uh, when you're at college and everyone around you is doing the same thing and there's more of a cost to failure right uh, I was gonna put up the stats uh, for the course I was in here we are uh, is that working can you see it I still see you. Oh, you have, oh, hang on. You there need to we go. click on okay. screen share, Dennis. Yeah. I got it now. Uh, I was surprised as the uh, the instructor went on, he mentioned a couple of times about what a wonderfully above average group we were compared to the typical Coursera course. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, roughly half the students in the course signed up for it and then forgot about it completely and never actually even uh, uh, opened a single lecture or looked at a single uh, handout. Dennis, and Dennis, I'm sorry. Your your screenshot is pretty blurry in my screen. I don't know if anyone else can read it, so maybe you could I, read I it out loud. I could read it. Okay. It's clear for okay. Me. okay. I may just have my resolution too low. Okay, I can see it now. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway, the, one of the things I mentioned on a blog, uh, a, a friend of mine who was. Uh, trying you know how many people try to lose weight uh, and yet uh, this friend of mine he was just he couldn't do it until there was money on the line there's a website out right now where you can uh, you put up some money and if you lose a certain amount of weight and it gets verified by some witness then they they double the money or, or everyone gets part of a pool or something like that and 
this guy's a doctor. You know, it's like 50 bucks. It's a meaningless amount of money, but for some reason, that additional motivation has been the only thing that could get him to do it. So, uh, as far as threat, the thing that makes me not so overly concerned about these as a threat is they could be the most wonderful education system in the world but if the only thing forcing you to completion is you sitting at home with no other peer pressure with nothing but your own you know inner ability to see something to completion we had that already you know with books <laughs> there was nothing that prevented people from doing self-help right now so uh, that just seems a limiting agency to me. Uh, somebody asked like 20 minutes ago, would you take another MOOC? Uh, I want to go back and answer that real quick. There are two conditions under which I think I would take one of these again. One is if the visual impact was an important part of the medium, and the other if it, if it was fun. And I don't mean that as in, I'm just not going to do this if it's not fun, but if it's fun, if I don't mind immersing myself in it for whatever amount of time it takes to get to completion, then yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But if it's purely for professional development, uh, I just feel like a, you know, learning from a book is a more efficient use of my time. If for no other reason, then the fast forward is easier to control. <laughs> How many of you had fast forwards on your... Uh, on your courses, which I almost never used because you're always worried that in the 30 seconds you skip over, something really important is going to come up. If I've got a book, I can look at the subject headings and go, okay, know that, know that, know, ah, here's something I haven't seen before. And I can control my experience uh, with a little more precision. Coursera you know, has an right. amazing thing where you can uh, speed it up just slightly. So if you want to get through it yeah. more quickly, you can ever talk more quickly. That's or what slow I was going to yeah. I was going to say, I read an article from uh, someone at Penn, my alma mater, who was taking a MOOC, and that's what they were saying. They realized they could speed it up by like 5% or 10% or something like that and get through the information faster. Okay. I, I watched most of mine at double speed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you think and, at double speed. Mark, and they also right? have the subtitles available as a text file in addition to being on the video itself. So if you don't have time to watch the video, you just given the, the text file. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you all see ways of adapting this to courses or to what extent can this kind of experience be fitted into your courses and un under what circumstances? So I, I actually see this being very useful in, in computer science potentially, especially in the early classes. I think a lot of this technology could go into a flipped gamified <laughs> classroom. Uh, I still want to be me as a faculty member around to answer questions to work with students individually, but the the fact that you can do automatic evaluation of a lot of computer science uh, really, I, I think, enhances the the ability to you know as 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 Gabe said, the parts we just need them to practice. We just need them to do it over and over again. If it's automatic evaluation, and if you can make it fun, you know, the thinness is fun aspect here. I think that this has the this type of technology, not necessarily MOOCs as they are, but the style of technology that's in them, could be made. It could be you know shaped into a form that would be very useful for us in some of our courses. I was going mm -hmm. to mention that a colleague at Centenary um, has been using a MOOC for independent study classes, basically. So you know. If a student wants to study a topic and he can't offer a course in it, he's been doing independent studies watching the MOOC with the student. Um, and I think that's a potentially very valuable use case is for these independent studies for classes we just can't offer. Has, has he looked at the terms of use on Coursera and Udacity to make sure that if they're charging tuition, they're not out of bounds of the law? Well, that's, that's interesting. I'm sh I know he was using a Coursera course, and I don't know their terms of service, but I know that Udacity makes its videos Creative Commons. So okay. you can do whatever the heck you want. Like, I have a friend who recorded a Udacity course, John Regeer. He teaches at the University of Utah. And the Creative Commons licensing was one of the only reasons he agreed to do it. Okay. You know, the fact that he could then make use of the material in his own classes without any legal haranguing. Uh, I don't know what it is for Coursera, though. That's a great question. My memory is Coursera is far more restrictive. Ah. I was, I was just to chime in on that, I, I do think that um, depending on 
different usage rights and, and how that works out, there's the potential definitely for, for interesting, especially the advanced students that are highly motivated learners. Um, are, are there some of the ones that are best suited for doing some of these MOOCs and best prepared to learn and benefit from them? And you know, here at Center, we have essentially three three professors in computer science, and two of us teach half math in computer science. So it's a sum total of two people, essentially. And so the you know the variety of courses that we can offer at a you know in a very small program like this is is quite limited. So there's a large number of advanced topics in computer science um, that you know we'll never be able to fit into our regular um, our regular schedules of course offerings. And it would be nice to let students um, get some of the benefits they would have gotten had they gone to a school with thousands, um, you know, or tens of thousands of, of students or many people studying computer science where they offer advanced courses. And uh, something like MOOCs is a definitely an avenue that, that could let that kind of thing happen, mm. I think. Gary, what do you think? Um, my perspective is more from the humanities, because um, I was an English major undergrad, but I, I can't see MOOCs ever taking the place of liberal arts education in terms of humanities courses, because so much of, of the learning that goes on is based on discussion and interaction and feedback. And, um, you know, the feedback in my course was completely useless. You know, it was peer assessment. We were writing essays. Um, but if they made comments at all, they weren't useful. Uh, could I chime in there? We have um, Jenny Brown, who isn't, who isn't with us today, um, but who reported on her MOOC experience at a forum here last fall um, and who blogged about it on our, our ACS MOOC blog. Um, she said that in her, her MOOC experience, she took the poetry MOOC, which I think was on Coursera. Um, and she said, you know, she was directing her students to some of those videos because what they did is they had a, a seminar, um, they filmed a seminar discussion. So it was oh. actually for her a good model of a, dis a good discussion. You know, you, you, we've all had experiences with class discussions that go nowhere. Right, but if you have if you have a, a class discussion on film, and you can point to it and say, "Look, this is what a good class discussion looks like." Let's try strive for that. You know, I, I think um, at Trinity, as far as I know, our, our flipped classroom approaches have have tended to be when when people are adopting flipped classroom, they tend to do the sage on the stage on video, right? And so this is kind of an alternative that we could think about is what if we have the conversation on the stage as a model, not to replace what we're doing in the classroom, but to, to serve as a, as a model or an example, um, something that, you know, if these graduate students at Penn have this kind of conversation, what do we need to do to get our, ourselves to that level? So I think that there's some interesting things that we can learn from, from the way that um, discussion can be done online. Yeah, I think it's it's been interesting to me hearing the schools that say they want to experiment with MOOCs as a way of experimenting with digital pedagogy. And that was mm -hmm. true of uh, both uh, Wesleyan and uh, Wellesley. And um, I was talking to uh, Ryan Hoover, who teaches English at St. Ed's, uh, St. Edwards in Austin. And he, um, Mark has gone already, but he's proposing a sort of uh, very similar gamified um, writing class but where they will actually be, they will be doing peer review of each other's works, but the teachers will be there, the instructors will be there monitoring it. So they're taking some of the pedagogical lessons and the things that could work well in a MOOC, especially, um, and, and letting the students um, take all the elements in the course, but they can do it in whatever order they want. They just have to get a certain number of points to finish, but yeah. that there will be instructors sort of monitoring everything that's going on. So they're taking some of the pieces of it, but providing the liberal arts structure that I think we all see that's necessary. Right. And I think the size of the course is really what makes the difference. Um, if you have a small enough group, then they know each other, they can interact each other with that knowledge, and the professor can facilitate and stimulate that discussion. With 27,000 people, like we're in my course, with 4,000 different threads for discussion. <laughs> a little, little harder. Yeah. How, how, how can ACS be helpful, or as a next step do you see a role for us as a consortium again we have some funds for further experimentation is that worth it can can you give us some advice based on your experience 
Well, the first way I can see this uh, going that I would actually use it on, on our scale is we've had a problem for some time because we have an engineering school and more and more we're getting uh, first generation students in and students who aren't necessarily coming from the best uh, math preparation and they come in and if they don't hit the ground running in their engineering courses, they pretty much cannot finish in four years. And we're increasingly get more students who have trouble in their very first semester, and then that's it. They're already screwed. They're going five. Uh, it'd be nice to have uh, some kind of bridge program to help them kind of catch up to the point where they're ready for Calc 1, they're ready for their first design course, and they don't fall behind. Uh, I've kind of been repeatedly told that there's no way you're going to get all these people on campus. You know, four or six, however many weeks you need in advance. But if you had this kind of distributed course that you could tell them, okay, welcome to Trinity. We'll see you in three months. And I strongly suggest that you look through some of this so that you'll be uh, ready to start when you get here. Uh, something like that would be really useful and not site specific. Something like just catching up in math, kind of a pre pre-calc uh, refresher is something that could be used across whichever school would be okay. interested. Are there OLI modules in math for that? Because I know that that's what Bryn Mawr was doing with their experimentation with hybrid and blended learning. It was exactly the kind of thing you were talking about, prepping students who wanted to major in science and really weren't there when they started school. Uh, I, I mean, the at, at Caltech, they actually made them come early. So I, yeah. I, I don't have an experience with doing this online, just always face-to-face. -face. I, I know as someone that would be probably supporting uh, some number of this in terms of development from the technology standpoint that um, having any kind of best practices in terms of production would be really helpful. Uh, there's been some of this type of chatter that's out there, but um, we have found that um, it's pretty easy to do very low quality. It's a whole other thing to do the type of quality that makes it, um, it at all even reasonably visually compelling. Um, and and I, I think having some of those things sort of codified in a way that you can make as a deliverable would be really nice. Can we do, do that in webinar form or module form? How would we get at that, Robert? Uh, even even something like just a working website of, of collected best practices from um, equipment setup, uh, design practices, um, just there's there's sort of a whole gamut of pieces that could go into that. Of course, me being the, the, the AV tech guy, I'm much more interested in microphones and cameras, but that's certainly not the only portion of this I recognize. So um, I, I think there's probably room for a lot of these pieces uh, to go into that to to at least give you some blueprint for getting started if you want to start putting some of this stuff um, into those spaces. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, when I, I started taking the edX intro computer science MOOC last fall, and I quickly switched to a Udacity course because I found it to be better, but I've, I, I was really struck with the low quality of the of the video production. In fact, you know, there were a lot of screen screenshots, screencasting of the coding going on, but the action was always at the bottom of the screen and it was always right under the closed captioning. So exactly what you wanted to be seeing was under the closed captioning. So so there is a, a, a learning curve here for the instructors and, and the support staff on how to do this well and effectively you know like Dennis was saying you don't need all the bells and whistles and the animations and things like that but you do need to have something that is watchable and not just you know I mean we've all had sort of throwaway lectures right where you're, where you're not quite prepared enough for class but you wing it um, if you're if you're gonna videotape yourself you need to be a little bit more than winging it right so so to have um, some of those, even even things that seem like common sense, just to write it down, as Rob suggests, um, what kinds of hints can you give yourself so that you come off as natural but not and not scripted, but you are coming off as prepared when you're sitting in front of the camera in your office talking to your students and anyone else who catches you on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We have a summer teaching workshop every summer, but I wonder to what extent we might have some in response to what you just recommended. Maybe workshops, maybe webinars, 
specifically on that point. Um, any any other recommendations? This is very helpful. Well, if if the associated colleges schools do start um, producing uh, MOOCs, it would be nice to have some way of crowdsourcing the subtitles for them in the way that Coursera partners with Amara, um, because those make such a big difference for for students who have any kind of hearing impairment at all. Good point. Should we do? Uh, uh, some faculty at SWANI or in environmental studies are talking to some of their colleagues about actually producing a, a MOOC. Is that a useful thing potentially, or would you warn them away from that? I mean, really, they need to find out if it has an audience, right? Is there a demand for what they're producing? Is there someone who would want to consume it? So maybe a role for ACS here is just providing some networking opportunities to see if faculty at different institutions can produce resources that can be used in a complementary way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not imagining specifically what that would be at the moment, but off the top of my head, that's one way forward that could have some utility if there's the demand for it. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to produce a MOOC and invest all the effort into it if there isn't some reasonable belief it has an audience. Right. You know, a lot of what's been charming about the more recent MOOC movement is the idea of sit in a Harvard class, sit in a Stanford class. You know, well, people, you know, it, 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 the elite cachet has been the source of the demand. Well, we could um, sit in a Hendrix class. Okay. I mean, I think that, you know, anybody would want to do that, but um, it, it doesn't have the same automatic cachet, you know, and so I wouldn't want to see resources squandered for something like that unless there's some reasonable belief that it'll have some utility. And I think that's possible. I'm just, I don't, but I don't think it's automatic. I, I wonder, would anyone consider doing a MOOC as a applied learning experience for your students? And what I'm thinking is, one of the things that intrigued me about the Wesleyan MOOC was that there were former students who had taken that class who were coming back and sort of being TAs or mentors for it. And the class itself was an outreach opportunity and a project for the institution. So I'm not sure how many people they were serving, but it was very interesting to me that one of the learning outcomes for the school was really that it was giving them something to focus efforts around. So then is, you know, design a MOOC a prospect for for your students as a public service? I mean, is there any potential for that kind of thing? I mean, that's a different thing entirely because now you're talking about it being an educational opportunity. So mm -hmm. I could see that being a lot of fun, right? You could have students design a unit for, say, some high school kids um, or what have you. And part of the value added there is they both get the video production experience, the curricular experience, but then they also can follow up in person with the students that were using the materials and um, so they get a video production experience tied in with an interaction with an audience and so that has educational benefit and so whether it had a broader audience would be of less interest I think at that point just mm -hmm. because now students are benefiting from it in a concrete way. I, I do want to say I mean kind of along those lines I don't see very much benefit to taking essentially a lecture or, or course in its you know, physical form and just trying to translate it into an online version for dissemination. I mean, just trying to package that up. I, I just, I don't see a lot of, I mean, there is some value to that, but I really don't think that that's, um, that's what we do well in general as faculty at liberal arts colleges. And I also don't know necessarily why we would want to do that. I, I think that, that um, it's more likely that would just come out as a worse version of the in, the in sort of in-person course that one might have had. Um, I, I think what is more interesting is trying to push the boundaries of what kinds of outside the box new types of courses become possible that you know wouldn't have been possible before. How can we use this technology in strikingly new ways, in ways that might not even be you know considered a course or something, but uh, mm -hmm. but just using the tools and the technology of connecting a lot of people um, with potentially some automated software that helps certain aspects of that 
those interactions. Um, so I think that there might be sort of some space to explore there. One thing I just noticed recently, uh, one of the Coursera courses on data science um, is opened up where they have, you know, they have thousands of, of people or, I don't know, tens of thousands of people enrolled, but they're also asking nonprofits to provide data for them to analyze. Um, and then the idea is the students would analyze this data, the nonprofits might learn something from students analyzing and creating visualizations of their data. So it's kind of trying to create like an exchange between um, nonprofits that could use the services and students trying to learn how to do it. Now it may just result in a whole lot of mediocre work getting done and a lot of people's time being wasted. I don't know, but it's a really interesting experiment. Yeah. One, one thing I, I want to add here, I'm sorry, um, is that I think there's a lot of value to this if we, if we leave out the, the C of MOOC. Uh, I don't know that these have to be courses. They could be sub units of courses or open educational resources um, for Dennis's remediation idea you know if there are particular concepts that students struggle with in those first few weeks of, of Calc 1 is there um, uh, an open educational resource that you can refer them to so you don't use class time for that we have a couple of faculty members here working um, with support from ACS on some materials to teach math students to use LaTeX so that they don't have to teach them that in class time. Um, and, I, and I know that when, it, when we started this project, someone, I think it was from Hendrix, called me about, you know, developing, the idea of developing a MOOC to prepare students for, for field work in biology. Hmm. So, you know, if there are these things that either go across classes where all students taking ecology courses have to have some background of field work, or some students in Calc 1 are going to need a refresher course in some topic, right? That there are these sort of course uh, units that are beyond the course level or beneath the course level that could be um, tackled with some of these technologies or approaches. So I you think, think that's... That, let, let me just yeah. say, I, I think there are a number of people that would say you don't have to take the C out of MOOC because it's already not there. Um, that it's possible that it, m many of the things that are currently passing as MOOCs are not courses in the sense that we would like to, to, to call them. I mean, it just depends on how you define course, of course. Um, what you've done is very helpful. I think that's broadening our perspective here. I can imagine a request for proposals that are very, that is very broad, just as you say, not, not be fixed on courses at all. Okay. I, I think I had interrupted Mary. Did you have something that you wanted to add? Well, I, I think the idea of preparatory courses is fantastic. Um, you know, there are so many things at Furman that nobody wants to teach and, and aren't really the stuff of, of a liberal arts course, but like plagiarism and study skills and um, stuff like that, that it would be great if we had something we could share among ACS schools so mm -hmm. that nobody would have to teach it. I'm, I guess I'm a little less optimistic on that front. I, I don't know. At least it seems like there's been some evidence, and I guess the studies vary, but that suggests that, again, the least prepared students, the remedial type stuff may actually be some of the, the worst stuff to try to put online and get people to learn effectively in a self-motivated format, um, because these are the people who are not as self-motivated learners are not as effective at learning things on their own and just trying to shunt that into a oh they'll pick it up on their own in some online course uh -huh. it may be a mistake uh, it, it might be it'd be fantastic in some ways if it worked I guess but uh, I'm not convinced it will well, we could the, experiment. Um, the beauty is we could encourage faculty to experiment with that and see what happens yeah it may, it may be a matter of figuring out what the right topics are I know um, Bryn Mawr had a next generation uh, learning challenge grant and one of the things they found was that they were targeting remedial math and it worked in some cases but there were cases for some students where it was it more practice that they needed so even though they were doing the practice and they were using these well-designed modules from Carnegie Mellon's open learning initiative um, the problem was what they really did need is somebody mentoring them through it to get past a mental block that and their mental block was I'm not good at math so it is, it is kind of interesting, I mean, and I wonder where, you know, what are those cases where people just need more practice? And I'm thinking, you know, like for teaching Latin, right? 
I need my students to memorize paradigms, and you could do that just doing exercises on online. Um, but they also need lots of practice translating texts in front of other people. So, yeah. you know, I, I think experimentation to figure out where those lines are could be interesting to figure out what what you could be moving out of class. We have an experiment starting here at Trinity. Our um, I think it was in, in the fall, our McNair Scholars Program, these are first generation and, and, and students from underrepresented groups who are being mentored to um, go on to graduate school and research careers. And, and in the fall, our um, McNair program put a tablet in each of their hands. And they're in the process of developing, um, assembling existing apps and tools and online courses like, you know, test prep types of things and also using those tablets in their advising process so all of their checklists for advising are going to be t on the tablet um, and so I think that there are some ways of of integrating the, the mentoring into the technology and vice versa so you know they do an assessment and then they get immediate feedback from from an advisor or they meet with their advisor and the advisor says these are the three core or mini courses that you should take. So I think that that putting those things hand in hand might might be a successful strategy. At least that's what we're hoping with this McNair experiment. Mm, very interesting. And there must also be a way to fight the I'm not good at math thing with a video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some sort of psychological manipulation. Mm -hmm. Make them all watch by heart on YouTube. Make them all watch by like heart. A video with a Maybe, subliminal but, message uh -huh. underneath that says, Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. And some kind Maybe, of but, I mean, I emotional think, message. Right, I mean, what's, what is missing in most of these, I mean, pretty much all these MOOCs, again, what is missing is some sort of emotional connection that you make with, you know, with an instructor. And, and you know, I certainly see that in my own classes. It, it makes a big difference that, you know, the, stu the students know that I care about them. I want them to succeed. Um, and you know, and, and that's that may be that may be more the reason they do some things sometimes rather than they care about the grade or they care about you know it's like they don't want to disappoint me, um, and they, they so, know that I care. So I, I don't know. I mean, there, yes, maybe we can motivate them with videos, but I'm not sure we can. So maybe then the MOOCs could be a great thing for liberal arts colleges because if enough people do these and and realize what they're missing, <laughs> then we can actually say. Are you tired of being taught by a soulless automaton? Come back. <laughs> <laughs> love, okay. love it. Let okay. me ask a quick, quick question. We, we, we talk in the consortium a lot about how we deal with less commonly taught languages, how we respond to an interest in upper level Chinese, dealing with German in which student interest is, is a le less and less, or, or, or MOOCs, or some something here relevant to any of those areas upper level physics maybe some areas that otherwise aren't available or not I, I, again again I mean I think this at least in computer science I feel they very much are uh, for possible things that we might not you know be able to offer otherwise there's certainly and it's not necessarily the fact they're MOOCs. It's just having resources that have placed, um, you know, a certain body of knowledge in an accessible, scaffolded, you know, sequence of things to learn. Um, they provide good resources to to point students to. And I've certainly been doing this in a number of my classes. I'll just say, you know, and if you're interested in learning more about this subject over the summer or something, you might check out. Uh, and you know, there's a course on this topic out there for free, you might go do it. You know, not for credit, just because you want to learn more about this. Give it a try. Um, I, I think there's some potential there. I don't know to what extent. Wayne, I think um, now that you had a taste of these Google Hangouts, um, I think I'm ready that, for more. This is tremendous. Um, this is terrific. I, I think that there's some, particularly for language learning, I would say that there that this particular platform, because of the kind of naturalness, I mean, I feel like we're all sitting in the same room right now, uh, because well, of the naturalness. The eye contact. That's the thing. I yeah, it is. It is. But but I think for language learning to have a seminar where you can converse this this way in in Mandarin. Um, it, it, there are some interesting possibilities there for ACS schools to collaborate, and you know that an upper level seminar that would would only have two students here at Trinity, um, you know, might have a dozen students across ACS. Um, it 
you'd have to juggle a little bit time zones and things like that and it wouldn't be asynchronous but that you want the synchronous in, in the language training you want the synchronous communication and I think this particular platform is pretty neat yeah. um, for that kind of class we've had some southwestern and Rollins have had parts of a joint class in Chinese uh, Mm -hmm. Hendrix, uh, J. McDaniels off, has offered uh, courses with four Chinese universities, for example. So we have some of that mm -hmm. going on. We'll need to look at, at more. Okay. And um, I'll, I'll share with all of you a, a, a video that someone at um, Texas State did about uh, using this Google Hangout platform for a, a writing seminar where they actually looked simultaneously at a Google Doc together and edited passages together and they were having a conversation like we are now um, and the instructor actually put together a video about how he did that and why and the result. So I'll share that um, with all of you because I think that that's a really interesting example of synchronous online um, liberal arts style instruction that, yeah. that could be very amenable to ACS institutions. I think the online part is the least disruptive part of MOOCs. It's the massive and the open that make it so different. Mm -hmm. Do you, are any of you acquainted with the semester online? They're contacting a number of our institutions right now wanting to offer courses at some point from Emory and Washington University of St. Louis and so on. Does anybody know about that? Have any feel for that? Mary? Well, I was a little bit confused. It, it looks like you may not necessarily get your first choice. Like you would just say, okay, I want a, a, one of these online classes, but um, they may not put you in the one that you want. I don't know. I, I don't know why somebody, if they're going to be. Uh, yeah, I, 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 never mind. I haven't heard of this. Could, could someone just clarify what its overarching goal is or? Well, I think it's to uh, financially sustain <laughs> Emory and Washington University in case Western Reserve. There are a dozen or so founding members uh, from large institutions. Uh, and they're now in touch with our institutions kind of one at a time. They've called me to see whether we'd be interested in taking some of these these courses. Uh, Rebecca, it, do you have a sense of that? I think, I've, I think I've looked at them before, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it's a place I'm thinking of, is one of the propositions, right, that you could take a course from them, say, if you're studying abroad, and you needed to get a course in sequence that you might otherwise miss, mm. you could do one from them. Is that the use case I saw? I don't know about that. Yeah. Okay. I, I do remember seeing them, but right, it's another place. And there's, there is another... Um, consortia of independent colleges that, that has for a while now been doing online courses and for each other. You join the consortium and your students can take courses from each other. But that one was aimed at these small places that also had a lot of adult students who, non-traditional students who would want courses at different times. So you have non-traditional students, they can't get the courses they want at your school and you could join this consortium and they could get them that way. So we we're, there's definitely some play in those marketplaces. Um, is, that, is that a Kansas group? Do you know offhand? It might be. It was written up, the guy uh, Farrell who did the book um, Liberal Arts at the Brink, I think yeah. Claudia might have sent that to me. Maybe not. Anyway, it's the guy who did Liberal Arts at the Brink. He, in the chapter where he mentions Sunoikosis, he also mentions this other group. Um, and Semester Online wasn't around then. But um, So yeah, I mean there's some places I think the general proposition is for some reason your schools, your students are away from campus and they might want to take a course. Hmm. And and the idea was that if you were all members of the same consortium group doing it, you would know that these were good courses. That's yeah. the proposition yeah. from them, yeah. Yeah. that you could trust them as a provider. Mm -hmm. So so we are past the hour mark and um, so we should be wrapping up. Does anyone have any closing comments? We will have another chance. We'll do more of these, a couple more of these, um, and explore some specific topics like openness or assessment, so that we can get you know drill down a little bit. This was sort of the more institutional level discussion. 
So Audie, last may I, chance. May, may I just say thanks before others say anything. Uh, this has been enormously helpful to me. I really, really appreciate the feedback and the ideas and whole set of suggestions for where we might go in the future. We really do want to test and experiment some more. We, we just need your wisdom as we're going forward. It's one of these cases where I think we have a series of grants. We've got some funds that can be very helpful, but we need your wisdom and, and we have a lot of good ideas today on where we go next. But Claudia, will there be any kind of a summary of this? Um, well, we'll we, we do have that ACS grant and we'll have a report um, okay. as, as our sort of final okay. um, delivery object on that grant. Yeah. And when is your final delivery object unloaded <laughs> for the rest of us? We'll, we'll be, I mean, we'll, we'll certainly, first of all, this video will be online, so okay. people can watch it or review it, um, assuming the Hangout work does promise. Um, and the, our schedule is to finish up the, in the next month or so and get everybody paid off the grant and, and submit the financial and, and substantive reports um, in the summer, sometime June, July. Okay. And then September 12, so you all know, is the next deadline for proposals in, in ACS, if anyone is so inclined. Okay. No final words? <laughs> Thank you. Got an interesting yeah. chat. Right. Thanks, everybody. All right. This has been good. Value. Thank you, Claudia, for putting it together. All right, everybody. Dennis and I have to go to a faculty forum. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I Good to, to see you. Thanks. Forget faculty forum. <laughs> okay, Great bye. Appreciate all the help. Bye.